This is Senate Judiciary. It's finally Friday. And um, we are taking up S-184, dealing with justifiable homicide. Um, bill was introduced by members of the committee. Uh, and the lead sponsor is Senator Benning. And um, they want to say a few words about it before we... <clears throat> Turn it over to Eric for a walk through the bill. Thank you, Senator Sears. Um, last year, we passed a bill out of committee to tweak the justifiable homicide statute. And the easiest way to describe what we're trying to do with this bill is to make clear whether an individual who is not directly themselves under threat of legal of lethal harm has nevertheless the ability to act on behalf of another who is. And I'm gonna use our committee room, which we all miss as a classic example. If we were all back in committee and a, somebody coming in with a knife, for instance, came through the door and started stabbing people, Peggy is behind her little wall there behind the filing cabinet and probably is uh, not obvious to the individual who is doing the stabbing. But if in the process of the individual stabbing somebody else, Peggy, completely unknown to the perpetrator, stands up and whacks the perpetrator over the head, normally we would all assume she has done so with the protection of justifiable homicide. But the way we ended up with the bill coming out of committee, we kind of muddied that up. And you, it was not the fault of anyone in particular. In fact, I'm gonna blame myself most of all because I should have picked up on this a lot sooner. But at the end of the day, what we ended up doing was kind of muddying that up. The um, response by ledge counsel at the time was that, well, this was common law anyway. And I concede that. But in any courtroom, a judge, when reviewing the law and how to apply it, is going to look to the plain meaning of the statute first. We ended up having uh, Chair Sears and Chair uh, Grad from the House Committee writing a letter to the governor saying, this is what we did not intend to do. Um, but that letter, will fade in history and eventually there will be a judge looking at the plain meaning of the statute and trying to apply it and figuring out whether or not legislative intent uh, is plain on its face. After the um, letter had been sent, and actually it might've been during the time the letter had been sent, I was receiving messages uh, from both the Defender General and from the Attorney General's office, as well as the state's <clears throat> attorneys and sheriffs and several different uh, interest groups saying, this um, is probably not the clearest thing that's out there right now and it's causing some confusion. So we had some back and forth correspondence. Uh, you're gonna hear from some of those witnesses today as to what the tweak needed to be. Um, I'm gonna, I'm hoping Evan Meehan is on the screen right now and I'm just gonna send a message out to him that Evan had presented to me a, a a fairly, um, it was more substantive uh, and probably is an eventual direction I'd like to go in, but just for Evan's edification, I tried to keep it as simple as possible for this stage uh, to get the issue back in front of us. Um, there are all kinds of things about the justifiable homicide statute that I would concede could be addressed, should be addressed, but for step one of introducing the bill and getting the conversation started, the only thing that we're trying to make clear is in the instance of Peggy's example, um, that she would still remain protected as uh, acting in justifiable homicide. That's pretty much it. Um, the bill that you're talking about was, I believe, H145 and had to do with use of force. And the language that was in the law that we changed included in the just and necessary defense of his or her 
her own life or the life of his or her husband, wife, um, parent, child, brother, sister, master, mistress, servant, and um, guardian or ward. That was when it could be could be used. So that was the the statute that we were trying to collect. Um, and obviously, um, master, mistress, servant <coughs> are words that are no longer used. So it was very limited in before S-145, um, so, or H-145, excuse me, yes, yeah. please, Bill. So if you, um, so that that's kind of the history. Uh, Eric Brin here did uh, a memo on the bill. It would be helpful to have that on the committee webpage. You still have it somewhere in your files. Yes, yeah, sir, I can track that down. Justifiable. I was just looking for my own copy of it. And I couldn't find it in my 145 file. So with that, the bill actually dealt Mr. with Chair? a lot of other subjects. Yes, Senator so, Bruce. Sorry, I was wondering if I could ask Joe a question. Sure. Joe, just wondering, um, having just heard that language, um, so your language as I read it is any other person Thoughts on that difference between limiting it essentially within the family or in this case, covering everybody? Or Eric? I'm, I'm afraid those two portions of the statute are being mixed up. This, this, this correction is not to do with the portion of the statute that identifies uh, those relations that Senator Sears just indicated. There's two different subdivisions of the statute. I, I had the act on the committee webpage, I was going to pull it up so that the committee could look at it and see what okay. the actual proposal is. It doesn't affect that piece of it. All right, I'll, I'll wait until we see what the application is. I, I'm glad you brought that up, though, Philip, because that list that specifies who is entitled to this protection. Um, Evan, me, and I were having a conversation about what, why is there a list. Um, and I don't know that um, I can explain it, except to say it's been long held that, uh, for instance, a family member has a right to protect a family member. And there's a delicate balance between the George, I'm sorry, the, um, the Georgia Arbery. man, Arbery, thank you, that we were trying to address um, last year and then suddenly looking at a list and finding that only specific individuals can claim this protection, uh, that has never made any sense to me. And it was part of Evan's uh, initial proposal that we get into that conversation, but this bill does not go that far. It's only trying to make sure that we tweak uh, the word person uh, and make sure that whatever person that is is actually not required to be under lethal threat themselves when they act on behalf of another to protect them from some lethal threat. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if Eric uh, walked through the bill and then we can further the discussion. But I, this has been helpful to remind us of what we did. The letter probably from uh, Representative Grad and myself should also be on the web page about this bill. Eric. Um, oh, the letter, yes, Senator Sears, right? Okay, yep. Doesn't have to be right now, but as sure. we take it up, it's important to have the history. So yes. please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Good morning. Here to talk, nice to see you. Uh, here to talk about uh, S-184, inactuating to defense of others and justifiable homicide. I think as uh, Senator Sears and Senator Benning have just started the explanation about this, a, a good sense of it uh, that we already have. But I'm gonna also look uh, at the language of what was Act 27 from last year, which is what made the change that, that S-184 is trying to address. And I think that the concept to keep in mind is, is uh, to reiterate what Senator Benning said, is that, that, that prior to Act 27 of last year, the, the common law, such as it was, was that reasonable force could be used uh, to, to for in self-defense, in other words, when you think you yourself are in danger, or when you reasonably believe that another person is in danger. 
you could also use reasonable force. So you ever understand that? It under applied in both situations. You could when you thought yourself, you yourself was in danger, or another person was in danger. So that was the state of the law when Act 27 was passed. And as Senator Benning said, it, uh, the result of Act 27 is that there now appears to be some lack of clarity as to whether or not uh, the, the common law principle that you could use force to defend somebody else, as in the example Senator Benning described, uh, whether you could still do that. And that's unclear. And I'll take a look, let's take a look at the language and we can see exactly why that is and what S-184 does, uh, what proposes to do, I should say, uh, to correct that. So I'm gonna share my screen and pull up the relevant language in uh, Act 27 of last year. And here we are, this is Act 27. As Senator Sears mentioned, this it dealt with a number of topics related to law enforcement use of force. Uh, this was only one piece of that uh, detailed bill that dealt with quite a few subjects. And I believe it was, yeah, here it is. It was in section four, the justifiable homicide piece of the bill that we're looking at. And, and you'll see there's actually two, two subdivisions, one and two, in which changes were made. We're only dealing with subdivision two for purposes of S-184 so far. And actually, if you look closely at subdivision one, this is what Senator Sears was mentioning and, and Senator Bruth as well, referring to different relations. Uh, this substantively was not changed by Act 27. You'll see the changes are, are uh, well, I shouldn't say that. There are some changes, but, but if, you, if you look at them carefully, you see that mostly they are not substantive. For example, the first line talks about uh, you can use force in the just and necessary defense, just changing his or her to the person, so it's gender neutral. Second line uh, of his or her husband or wife, just changing that to spouse, so again, no change there substantively. Uh, parent, child, and then it had that list that Senator Sears was referring to. Brother, sister, and that just gets changed to sibling, so no, no substantive change there. And then it does strike master, mistress, and servant. We don't use those terms anymore. And then keeps the terms guardian and ward. So really not much change there substantively from what was existing law other than striking the terms master, mistress, and servant, which we don't use anymore. So that essentially preserves the law as it was. Uh, subdivision two is where the change came in. And this is the change that that is proposed to be um, uh, clarified by S-184. Now the new language you see is in the first three lines, but imagine for a moment that, that, that those three lines, the underlined language is not there. Cause you want to think of what the, what the law was before S, uh, sorry, Act 27 was passed. And in that case, reasonable force was okay Remember, just going to read the non underline the pre-existing language. In the suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated assault, burglary, or robbery. So again, suppression of a person attempting to commit any one of those things. It doesn't matter that the reasonable, that the person being threatened is either yourself or another person. In either situation, it's okay under that existing language. You're just trying to stop the person from committing one of those offenses. Um, if the, if the fear of the commission of the offense is of harm to yourself, that's encompassed within that language. If it's fear of harm to another person, that would also be encompassed in that pre-existing language. However, in Act 27, you added the underlying language. And that says it only applies if the person reasonably believed that he or she was in imminent peril and that it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force. And then it goes on to the rest of it. So you see, it, it's a change there. If the person reasonably believed that he or she was in imminent peril, it doesn't include uh, the belief that someone else was in imminent peril, which was the way the law had been before that. You could use the force not only to when you thought you yourself were in peril, but you thought another person was as well. So as Senator Sears mentioned, there was a, a back and forth about this last year, this, uh, this committee, uh, uh, Chair Sears and Chair Grad sent a letter to the governor clarifying that the legislature's intent was not to overrule that common law principle that uh, defense of others could be used. Uh, and the governor sent a letter back saying that, that he was concerned about whether or not the, the bill had that effect anyway. Um, so there was this back and forth. And I think everyone agrees, uh, as Senator Benning mentioned, that, that it was not the legislature's intent to, to overrule that common law principle. But the question is, even though 
it wasn't your intent, might the language be interpreted to do that anyway? And I think as, as Senator Betting mentioned that, yeah, the possibility is that it could, and you know, it's unclear. Um, it, it might be that, that a court was, when was reviewing the language might say, well, um, uh, you know, we have that letter from the committee chairs in hand. And uh, even though the plain language says otherwise, we're aware that, that uh, the legislature intended otherwise. So we're going to interpret it to mean that that common law defense of, of others still exists. But on the other hand, a court could look at the plain language of the statute and say, well, it doesn't say anything about defense of others. And in fact, you know, if you just read the plain language, uh, it seems to say that um, that the defense is only available if you're if you believe that you yourself are in imminent peril and that the legislature, you know, just looking at the plain language, overruled the common law. And I've looked at several cases on that is when the legislature is, is uh, passing a statute where the, when the courts interpret it as to being an overruling of the common law. And I think the conclusion is that it's not clear. The courts look at different factors. It depends on the circumstances. Um, and uh, you can't, I don't think one could say with confidence going forward that um, that common law defense of others principle would still be preserved with this language or whether it wouldn't. So, uh, as, as the committee knows from, from uh, our legislative council is neutral and we don't advocate for one side or the other, but one thing we always do advocate for is clarity. <laughs> whatever one chooses, whatever you choose for policy, we advocate for clarity. And I think the, the right move for clarity uh, is to put language in there that specifies whatever your intent was. So assuming Eric, that you're, yes, please. Before you move off this page into the proposal, Yep. Can you remind me or somebody remind me why we even did that in number two? Why we, because it seems pretty clear in the original language that it, <clears throat> why did we do that? You know, I, to be honest, I didn't staff the bill. I think as okay. Sears mentioned, it was Bryn, so I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, well, I can that. answer that. Okay. If you'd like. Yeah, we did I, it because we were concerned the case in Georgia had just occurred with Mr. Aubrey and his murder. Um, and we were, at the time, people were looking at Georgia statutes and, that, and the legislature there actually changed the statute um, in Georgia um, to make clear. And um, we were concerned at the time uh, about that, but we did not, I, I don't ever remember intending we wanted to make sure that we weren't allowing that type of behavior where a guy is out jogging three, um, well, two people shooting at him and another filming it. Um, we wanted to, we may have gone a little bit overboard in trying to make sure that that didn't happen, which was the reason for our letter. But um, as you can see from the language from uh, S, one uh, H one forty five clearly, um, you know, if you're just reading it, it was just he or she, and um, not anyone else. However, in one up above, you know, it did list a number of other people that you could protect. And so the question was, could somebody protect um, a stranger at that? Senator Benning described as Peggy in the committee room, um, somebody being injured. That was I, why. It was okay. really an overabundance of caution to avoid a situation like in Georgia where um, some referred to it as kill your neighbor bill or shoot your neighbor bill. I, I, I get that, but I, I think that in that case, they wouldn't, <clears throat> I might be wrong, but it, the suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, grab, aggravated sexual assault, burglary or robbery. I don't think he was attempting any of those things. So it shouldn't have been justifiable. Although they did say he was attempting burglary, but that wasn't. Yeah. Anyway, okay, I, I get it now. I remember. Senator Bruce. Yeah. I, I, I think another way, I'm. it's a little dim in my memory, but I think one of the things we were talking about was the original language 
says that you could suppress somebody who was attempting to commit burglary or robbery. You might yourself not be in any danger from them, but you see that yeah. they're committing a robbery. Should you be allowed to then pull out a gun and shoot them? The discussion turned on that. And so, as I remember, we added the underlying language so that you yourself have to be under threat um, in order to repel with deadly force. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. That, yeah, that, that helps. I, yes, and if I, could, if I could just jump in with that, Philip, my, uh, my understanding of everybody on the committee was trying to reach that question at some point in the discussion. Is it legitimate to use, for instance, deadly force if someone is burglarizing a building that you're not threatened in in any way, shape, or form, which was the Aubrey case? And in the, the noble attempt to try to get to that conversation, I'm not sure we yet have cleared um, a full discussion on that because in my own head, if somebody is committing a burglary uh, in a building across the street, the idea that I could use lethal force against that person, I find objectionable. Mm -hmm. So that's a conversation that I, I do think well, should be. But, but, but the language now prohibits that. And that is true, except that what we did was we did not um, protect an individual who was not in any um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confusing the two portions. You are, you are correct. Um, I just want to make sure that a judge reviewing this enables someone to say they were actually um, acting to protect somebody else from lethal yeah. uh, force. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah. let's move on. I think we all understand. I think we know what our intent was. Um, Governor's office picked up on it when he signed the bill, and Senator Grad, Representative Grad, and I sent a letter uh, clarifying our intent. Um, S-184 tries to um, put into statute what we meant. Yes, and and thank you for that that segue, Senator Sears, because that does bring us right into how S-184 attempts to correct that that um that legislative intent issue and make sure that the that the intent is exactly what it was you wanted it to be and you'll see that that, that language is on page two uh lines one and two and the idea here is that as senator Bruth and senator benning were just getting at by making that change you did you did change change the existence of the statute so that that um you know if there is that burglary going on across the street and nobody is in danger well, then you, you've covered that situation because you, you have to have, in order for someone to use force, there has to be a reasonable belief, um, uh, at least under the language passed last year, that, that the person themselves was in imminent peril. So it couldn't just be any burglary that's happening. There has to be that belief that, that, you, that the person is in peril. The issue was that uh, it may have inadvertently cut out the situation where you believe that someone else is in peril. So again, it's not just any random burglary. Someone does have to be in peril. It's just that uh, the language that got passed may have inadvertently excluded the common law ability to act when not only is it just yourself that's in, in imminent danger, it's another person. And so that's what the, the language attempts to correct. And you'll see it's just very, very straightforward. Um, it uh, expands it to make clear that uh, the person can act if the person reasonably believe uh, not just that he or she, and again, we change that to the person to be gender neutral, that the person reasonably believed that the person or any other person was in imminent peril, and it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly, deadly force. So again, it's you believe that you yourself is in peril or somebody else, and you have to has to be necessary to repel that with deadly force, then you can do so. Um, but it's not limited to you yourself anymore. It would be uh, uh, clarifying the intent to go back to what the common law principle was, which was that you could act uh, when another person is in peril as well. So again, Eric, pretty straightforward. Eric, yeah. can I ask a question before you scroll down on the page, if you go back up to paragraph uh, one, there is a, a reason for us to question whether paragraph one needs to exist at all. 
and that's just something I'm going to float out there as a, a potential amendment to this bill um, that I just don't understand the rhyme or reason why there would be a specific list. I think you're going to hear more about that from some of our other witnesses. Well, why don't we let the witnesses, um, before we start marking the bill up, why don't we hear from the witnesses? We don't want to protect grandpa. How about your <laughs> partner in life? How about your girlfriend? They're, they're not there either. The parent of your child. There, there's a lot well, of people not in that mixture there. On Okay. The I, I, I'm getting a little. So that's that we got the cart before the horse. And if we want to just send the bill out without testimony, that's fine with me. But I kind <laughs> of think we ought to let, listen to the witnesses. And I, I agree that. You know, we can look at all of that, um, but you don't want to have other intended, unintended consequences by striking something that's been in the law for centuries in um, terms Eric, of number one. Sorry, could Eric just go down a, a little more? Okay. Got it. Thanks, Eric. Sure. And yeah, that's it. As I say, the, the understanding the issue took some discussion, but the language itself is pretty straightforward. So um, that's all I have for the walkthrough. And I, I could pull that down, Senator Sears, if you want to start. Well, if you would, yeah. It's, it really is a simple little bill. Right. <laughs> I we invited um, Jay Persing Johnson from the governor's office to testify. And she said that uh, Mandy Wooster, I believe, was the person that we should hear from, from the governor's office. So if I've got the right name and right person, um, you're up next, Mandy. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Mandy. Welcome to Senate Judiciary, by the way, Mandy. And, uh, Thank you, Senator. I don't know if you know all the members, but you've heard from all of us. So, Yes, thank you very much. My name is Mandy Wooster. I'm the Executive Director of Policy Development for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm speaking specifically in the language changes that were drafted and to express the Department of Public Safety's support of these changes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Shortest testimony I've ever heard. <laughs> Very clear. That's good. Um, any questions from Mandy? So I assume that the administration believes that this uh, takes care of their concerns that were expressed in the governor's uh, message. Yes, Senator. Thank you. All right. Um, next on our list is Julio Thompson, Director of Civil Rights Op Unit, Civil Rights Unit in the Office of Attorney General. Julio, welcome back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you all and good morning. Uh, yes, Julio Thompson, Attorney General's Office, Civil Rights Unit Director. Um, you know, I, I, I think our office asked me rather than our criminal chief, uh, division chief to come over because I was present for a lot of the discussion in the prior session uh, about this statute, which, uh, you know, my impression was that it was sort of discovered uh, during the discussions relating to unlawful or, or rendering and articulating unlawful neck restraints in, in connection with law enforcement. Um, and, and I briefly mentioned in some of the, the discussion in the prior session, and I'll mention here that um, uh, that what actually happens in, and, and we have Judge Zoni and, and Evan who can uh, illustrate this or explain this further, but uh, in, in criminal court cases, uh, the courts are not hewing to the statute even before it was amended before. Uh, they have not limited um, uh, defense of others to just these the individuals who had been articulated in statute. The old language about mistress and master and that sort of thing, 
uh, that really comes from like early English common law. That self uh, defense of others was in early, early common law limited to certain relationships, but after the development of the model penal code, most states moved away from that and just simply articulated that you have the, uh, you have a defense to, or you, you have the right uh, to uh, defend others, regardless of what the relationship is, if there's that, is that threat level. Um, and, and as an example of how, where the courts uh, actually are, uh, Vermont has a model jury instruction. It's uh, instruction number CR 07-111 that was last revised in 2019 that articulates, for example, the self-defense standard uh, that the courts use. Um, and they don't limit it to relationships. They don't limit it to certain crimes. It's really based upon the reasonableness of the threat. Uh, and furthermore, uh, the courts uh, address the issue of self-defense in a more refined level, such as cases where the person who's trying to assert self-defense was the initial aggressor. So that might be, uh, to vary Senator Benning's uh, hypothetical, that might be a case where someone enters the room and Peggy pushes the person um, without justification. And then that person uh, responds unlawfully with uh, deadly force, pulls out a knife or a hatchet or something like that. And then, um, and then Peggy uses deadly force to repel that deadly attack. Um, so that's like, those are like complications and those have already been worked out uh, in case law that the, the, a variation of the hypothetical I just used was uh, addressed in a case called State v. Trombley back in 2002. Um, so um, what's curious about this statute is, is that it doesn't say anything about whether or to what extent it leaves the common law intact. And that's unlike um, uh, other statutes uh, that, that have various offenses to violent uh, offenses. For example, the aggravated assault statute, which is 13 VSA 1024, uh, in the final sections, you know, it has a section where they talk about when a person using a deadly weapon might may have a defense. And by the way, some of the language is quite similar to what we have here uh, in the homicide statute. So you might wanna look at that as well so that there's consistency uh, between aggravated assault and, and uh, homicide. But, but the final section of the, of the ag assault statute says that, you know, the defense section that's articulated here, quote, shall not be construed to limit or infringe upon defenses granted at common law. Uh, and so what, what they are doing is some, something I think was assumed uh, uh, and maybe correctly, but assumed by uh, alleged counsel in the last, last section, which is that this justifiable, justifiable homicide statute doesn't change the common law defenses, which are, uh, again, reflected in, in the case law as well as the model jury instructions. But the statute doesn't actually say that, unlike other statutes. So if you are looking uh, if you wish to preserve the, the common law that's arrived, uh, arisen in Vermont, especially with variations of the um, uh, of self-defense, uh, such as the initial aggressor rule, um, then you may want to add a subsection uh, to the justifiable homicide statute so that it's clearly stated uh, in the statute um, that it's not intended to limit um, the, you know, the, um, the law that the, the courts have uh, developed over, over the decades. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, if the legislature intends to keep the criminal offenses in here, which I, I in my sense is that they're not necessary. It's not, it's really the threat or the, the reasonable, the, per, the reasonable perception and response to the threat, regardless uh, of what the underlying offense is. Um, that, that, you know, that is what um, is really at the core of self-defense uh, and, and at, at the core of defense of others. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, subsection three, which um, is, you know, has a lots of cross sections re referring to the use of force standards that are required in, in statute. Um, uh, you know, there, there are, um, um, 
there are there are other statutes that refer to law enforcement use you know uses of force or or um, that are a lot simpler uh, and that the committee may want to consider. For example, um, there is a uh, there is a misdemeanor offense in Ch in Title 13, 13 VSA 401, or I'm sorry, 4011, 4011, uh, entitled "Aiming Gun at Another." Um, that makes it a misdemeanor to point a gun at somebody, except in self-defense, um, and that's not defined in that statute. By the way, it just says self-defense or, quote, in the lawful discharge of official duty, end quote. So, you know, if an officer is using a neck restraint or force, uh, that's lawful in those other statutes that are cross-referenced in, in uh, the bill here. Um, my, my question is just, would it be easier just to say that, um, you know, if the, the officer can do it, if it's otherwise, if it's lawful, and that would incorporate uh, not only co common law, um, but also the statute, the statutory sections here. Um, if, if you're just looking for simplicity, it, it wouldn't change the application of those statutes. It just wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't cite them and, 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 and ignore others that might be enacted later or, or, um, or raise a question about common law uh, interpretations of when an officer is acting under color of authority. Um, so I, I'll, stop there with, with those observations and, and be happy to answer any questions. Are there questions? Oh, well, I think you've been fairly clear. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, if I take away from your statements, 184 may not be necessary because it's already in common law. Well, I guess, I mean, the question, and, and I think it's great that we have um, we've got three, I'm looking now, I see Matt, Matt Valerio signed down. We've got really great witnesses on this. I mean, my question, and I'm not a, pro, a criminal prosecutor. So I come at this, I've come at this from the angle in civil rights for dealing with police use of force, which is, which is something uh, I'm quite familiar with and work on that issue in Vermont and, and a number of other jurisdictions. So, but I mean, you know, the larger question for me is, you know, is, is, the statutory defense uh, even necessary in light of the common law um, that exists now. And the fact that the, that the Vermont Supreme Court repeatedly articulates uh, a broader standard of self-defense without even citing this statute um, uh, suggests, you know, it suggests or it raises the question of whether what's called the, sometimes called the doctrine of desuetude or, or obsolescence is in play here where the, where the court's just ignoring what the statute says and just relying upon the common law pres precedents. And if, if the statute isn't really being used, especially where you're talking about application to defense of specified individuals um, or, you know, reference to only certain crimes, uh, you know, it's not clear to me that, that it's really necessary. But I think it is, um, uh, and, and that's the same is true with the, the model jury instructions. When you look at the legal authorities that are cited for the model jury instructions, they look at the common law cases and don't really talk about this statute, which is, which is pretty archaic. So, so I think that's the larger, that's one larger discussion. Um, and I, you know, I think simplicity, I think everybody wants simplicity and clarity and consistency. So if there is going to remain a statute, it would be helpful I think to include language indicating that you're preserving the common law doctrine. Um, but kind of the meta question is if you're preserving the common law doctrine, um, what, are, what is the statue actually adding? And relatedly, again, I would, I would recommend that you look at the aggravated um, uh, assault statute, which has almost the same language, almost identical language that you're grappling with here about um, you know, using deadly force um, in the defense of other, and then they specify other people as uh, the justifiable homicide statute does. Okay, thank you. Sure. Senator Baruth. Uh, I just wanted to say, I, I have, um, I find myself in line with the governor's uh, position and Mandy Worcester's position in terms of this language that we have in front of us, 184 being, um, 
straightforward in fixing the problem. I, I worry though, this is our third time with this statute and I, I Julio's testimony is, is uh, tweaking that worry a little bit. I, I think what's happened the last couple of times is we've, we've started to range out from what we're doing. So I, I would be all for um, sticking with the language of 184 as is and not going to other statutes or adding other uh, paragraphs or maybe taking away that one paragraph, but um, even something like adding the piece about um, conforming with common law, I, I think I, I would prefer myself not to get into new articulations or and just stick to clarifying that one piece. So for what it's worth, that's, that's where I am. Other uh, comments, questions? Uh, Julio, did you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, to get into the language a little bit, um, for example, in subsection two, that talks about, um, as I see the defense of others, is that there are uh, two conditions for defense of others. Um, which, and this, this is narrower than the common law defense of others. The, it too says that um, uh, you can, the person has to be in imminent peril. Actually, there's three elements. It's necessary to repel that peril uh, in, in condition three, in the forceful or violent suppression of a person attempting to commit these offenses. Uh, and, and it's both overbroad uh, and under inclusive, it's it's overbroad in the sense that um, there are um, uh, the, the question is whether well I, let me just deal with the under inclusive aspect for example so you can you can defend others if if a person's in peril and these you know these enumerated crimes are in progress. Um, and that sort of implies that if there are other crimes that are in progress and there's imminent peril, you can't invoke subsection two. For example, kidnapping uh, is, not, uh, is not listed here. Um, and so the question would be in kidnapping, does subsection two apply? Under the common law and the model penal code, really the question is if you reasonably believe that the person you seek to defend is an Im imminent peril and, and essentially that they would be entitled to use self-defense to repel the threat. And if you, so you can do it if they can do it. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it, it, to me, it's not that clear. And, and uh, because kidnapping, you know, and there are probably other violent offenses that um, uh, that could come, a person might be attempting to uh, violate the human trafficking statute uh, that would be another felony um, that's not mentioned here. So the question becomes: well, a person who um, is uh, is trying to is trying to rescue someone from a violent threat in connection with a smuggling or trafficking operation does does paragraph two apply to them or not? Um, under the court cases, I think in the common law, I think it would. Um, so I'm not sure how that you know what the value is here um, to identify the crime since. The point, the point under these cases is that it's not the crime itself that creates the justification, it's the peril. For example, you've heard testimony before about burglary for a building that may be unoccupied, or there are some forms of robbery that don't involve a weapon at all, like a strong round. It just involves force. So if you're pushing a college student down to take their, uh, their computer, that, that's robbery. Um, but it's not, it's the force that's being used isn't deadly, deadly or near deadly force. Um, it's so, and you wouldn't expect uh, someone to defend that with deadly force if they just saw someone grabbing, you know, a, a bag from somebody and, and trying to run uh, with no indication of a weapon or threat. You would, you would be judging it uh, by the threat that, you know, the threat of safety, not, not the underlying offense. So um, again, uh, subsection two here, I'm not sure what the value of it is. If, if the common law is broader, is the intent to narrow the common law? That's still not clear to me. I would think not. I would think that's not the intent, but uh, I'll stop there. Okay. 
Other comments, questions? All right, let's just move to, on. Just, just to say quickly, I, I appreciate your testimony, Julio, that the question of the list, uh, it's the same in paragraph two as it is in paragraph one for me. It's the, uh, the question is really, is the individual in imminent peril? It's not how that peril is arising. That's right. It's the degree of peril and it is the reasonableness of your response to it. So if it's a necessity to repel, I mean, the language is there in part of two, which is that's talking about necessary to repel. I mean, if you can stop an imminent threat with non-deadly force, uh, then it may be that you, you aren't able to uh, justify the use of deadly force. That's true. I mean, we, we see that with law enforcement, but just regular self-defense or defense of others. That's right. I mean, so, I mean, the um, the language, I, and I'm only speculating here because I haven't done a, a dive into the legislative history beyond the law, but it really does smack of the early common law where there were certain enumerated offenses or enumerated, enumerated relationships, which would just be presumed to be violent and deadly, like burglary. You know, the old common law definition of burglary used to be that it, it could only be committed at night to count as burglary. Uh, and so um, I think those are just um, relics and, and, and you don't really see the Vermont Supreme Court in the last couple of decades limiting the defense of self or others by the nature of the offense. It's always examining what the threat picture is. So I think I would agree with that. Okay. Uh, let's move on to Matt Valerio. Morning, Matt. Morning. Thanks for having me, as usual. Um, as uh, Senator Benning indicated uh, throughout the discussion last year and with the passage of the, the bill, um, dealing with this subject matter, I was expressing concerns about, uh, you know, leaving out defense of others as a, as a potential defense. Now, I believed that unless the legislature specifically said that they were eliminating common law defenses, um, that common law defenses would still exist um, regarding defense of others. And I agree completely um, with the Attorney General's office that, um, I, uh, that those that developed case law over a period of time is significantly broader than the statute um, attempts to deal with. Uh, this is, you know, we're we're in an interesting uh, um, situation in, in New England. Really, um, we don't have um, model penal code states. We tend to cling to our common law roots. Uh, my experience prior to coming it's granted it's 35 years ago at this point but in massachusetts um was that uh you know that i mean they don't even have a uh, rules of evidence all of their rules of evidence all their rules of evidence are common law rules of evidence um, so it's not a statutory or court created rules of evidence and we sort of cling to that tradition um and what at some point in Vermont, there was an attempt, and granted it's been decades, you know, many decades, um, to set forth, and it might have been in, re in response to some case that is now no longer within anybody's memory, um, where they, there was an attempt to codify the um, justifiable homicide uh, provisions that had developed over time in the common law. Uh, and so you end up with the bill that talks about the relationships and the like, um, and, or you end up with the law that talks about the relationships and the like. Um, and uh, those relationships, just by virtue of the, even the discussion of the, the terms used, did make, don't make a lot of sense in today's, uh, in today's world. But the concept of self-defense and the defense of others and the ability to meet a threat 
with force sufficient to repel the threat um, and under certain circumstances use deadly force is something that is uh, very, uh, you know, well embedded in the common law going back, you know, hundreds of years. Um, I didn't believe, now when we talked about this, I said, geez, you, you know, you, you should have a defense of others in there. And, uh, you know, how imperative is this? How difficult, you know, what, what is the, what is the uh, problem? Well, I, I believed that unless the legislature specifically um, said that we are eliminating all common law defenses and these are the only ones you get on this subject matter, that those common law defenses still existed. But as uh, Eric said earlier, uh, some of the case law, if you look at it, is a little bit vague about what happens when the legislature acts and whether it uh, legislature acts in a manner that is intended to eliminate um, prior defenses, common law defenses, or they are, you know, whether it depends, do you read it broadly? Do you read it uh, narrowly? This at least says, and, and I and I do support the bill, that there are, um, that, the, that the legislature recognizes the self-defense and defense of others um, as part of the statutory scheme. Um, I would, the only thing I would ask as part of the bill is maybe that the legislature say that this does, that this, uh, uh, this law, this bill does not eliminate um, common law defenses that are generally available. Um, and so that you are specifically saying that we recognize this as a, uh, as a defense and we do not, uh, and we are not attempting by this to eliminate uh, common law defenses that have been developed by the court over a long period of years. Um, I do think that, you know, one of the things that was going on last year, obviously, is that there was a response to cases and situations that were in the news and trying to tailor a bill to say, well, we don't want, you know, you're trying to tailor a bill to, to look at um, those situations should they occur in Vermont. Uh, and that's always a little bit of a dangerous thing to do. And it's one of those things that I always warn against um, in response to, you know, high profile cases or particular situations rather than looking at the, you know, the broader, um, you know, policy uh, issues uh, and, and really the history of, uh, in this case, self-defense and defense of others. I, I don't think that there's any um, doubt that under common law, there is a defense of others uh, that is available. Although I could see with the bill as it was passed, that a prosecutor who uh, could read it in a particular way would be arguing that there is no defense of others available because the legislature eliminated it by um, creating the bill that was there last year. And so um, I do think that obviously, I mean, maybe it isn't obvious, but I, I think that it's the defense of others, defense of self, defense of others and defense under particular circumstances. Um, you know, where there's an imminent uh, serious threat uh, is perfectly acceptable. Um, I think that most people would say that I have a right to defend others and my family and my friends and and uh, and the like if they are confronted with, uh, um, you know, an imminent uh, deadly threat. So uh, we're supportive of the bill. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, Senator Benning's uh, small but important uh, addition in this bill um, clarifies the issue regarding defense of others. My only suggestion would be to for the legislature to specifically identify that this does not, uh, this bill does not uh, intend to eliminate. Uh, available common law defenses that have been developed over the years. Thank you, Matt. Actually, reading from the letter that 
uh, Representative Grad and I sent to the governor. Uh, the final paragraph is self-defense and defense of others under the common law are available to interveners now and will continue to be available once 1845 becomes law. It was not the intent of the General Assembly to limit the application of these common law defenses, nor does H-145 have the effect of limiting them. So I... Good legislative intent. Right. You know, it, to the extent that anybody in the in the uh, as a trial lawyer could find that, yeah, um, <laughs> no, it, it could be put into this bill. That's I think what you're suggesting is something yeah. of that nature would be added to this bill, right? Then they would see it. Hopefully, the judges read the statutes. I'm just curious. I'm 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 kind of setting up our next witness. I would say most of them. I do. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Judge. Uh, are there questions for Matt? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judge Zone, it's a great segue to hearing from you. Good morning. Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. So I've listened this morning, and I, I first want to say that the determination of whether you want the common law to continue, whether you want this extended for defense of others, that's a policy decision. Uh, the way I'm looking at this is consistent with how some of the prior speakers have looked at it. And I'll start with Senator Benning when he said it was muddied up. But I think that what we're seeking is clarity. And when we talk quite a bit today about common law, I think it might be helpful to just let you know what common law says about defense of others. And in 2016, the Vermont Supreme Court said that defense of others is essentially an extension of the self-defense instruction in that the actor may do in another's defense anything the person himself may have lawfully done in the circumstances. Thus, the prevailing rule is that one is justified in using reasonable force in defense of another, even a stranger, when he reasonably believes that the other is in immediate danger of unlawful bodily harm from his adversary and that the use of such force is necessary to avoid this danger. As with self-defense, even if the actor entertains these reasonable beliefs, he may not use more force than he reasonably believes necessary to relieve the risk of harm. And so that's the common law, the backdrop uh, upon which section 2305 comes into play. The question that has arisen, however, is, well, does 2305 change common law somehow? The Vermont Supreme Court in 2006 wrote that the common law is changed by a statute only if the statute overturns the common law in clear and unambiguous language, or if the statute is clearly inconsistent with the common law, or the statute attempts to cover the entire subject matter. And I would note that when the courts are looking at statutes, uh, legislative intent is an important component, but if the plain and unambiguous language fits something, generally that's where it stops, unless it leads to absurd or irrational uh, consequences. I also note that to the extent that the chairs of the committees have indicated legislative intent, while that does certainly have force, the court has to consider that there's 30 senators and a number of House of Representative members who may have shared that intent of the chairs and may not have. And so we really have to look at what the legislature as a whole, when enacting a statute, expresses as its intent. Uh, Mr. Thompson uh, referenced Section 1024, and that's on aggravated assault. And when I was looking at this statute for today under justifiable homicide, I also looked at 1024. And so what you have right now is under section 2305, a situation where you do not clearly say that you are maintaining the common law defenses. Yet a judge looking at it would say, well, wait a minute, the legislature in 1024 said it was clearly maintaining those. Why wouldn't they say it in 2305 if that was the intent? And the statute itself also doesn't talk about third person's defense of another. Well, why wouldn't the legislature have said that? Maybe that's their intent to change common law. And so as far as clarity, 
the change that is being advanced by this committee, uh, I would support. I think it is important to make it clear. You don't want any question about this. And to the extent that there could be a question about whether even with that change, there may be a, an intent by the legislature when it votes on this to change common law, I would concur with Mr. Valerio and say that that section from 1024 under subsection E that says this statute shall not be construed to limit or infringe upon defenses granted at common law. If that is what this uh, committee intends to put forward and the legislature would intend to enact, I would suggest making it clear. It is, uh, uh, Senator Sears, you shouldn't have to write a letter to the governor to say this was our intent. If we can get it in the statute, uh, I would suggest that's the, the way that we do it. And that way that uh, we are sure that the courts are given clear guidance and everyone knows what the, the rules are. Uh, thank you, Judge. Actually, reading um, further into the letter of May 12th to the governor, we cited State v. Buckley, the 2016 that you just cited, and you know, it couldn't be clearer that the actor may not use more force than he reasonably believes necessary to relieve the risk of harm. I suppose it should be he or her or, or they believe. But um, by and large, we're, we're going by Buckley. Um, and uh, so either we cite that or make clear that we're not impacting current common law. That would seem to clarify the issue as yeah. Senator Benning. And I, and I think it's beginning. actually fairly clear. You may not, you, you can use self-defense, but you, or, you know, in defense of others, but you may, may not use more force than reasonably he reasonably, they reasonably believe necessary to relieve the risk of harm. So if if you um, punch somebody and they're knocked out, you, you don't go continue to kick them. That's how I read that. So I think it's all right in the letter. And if you wanna just kind of put in the statute that, What's in the letter? Probably. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the judge? We're going to see you in a few minutes, I expect. That, um, so yes, eleven o'clock. We'll be here. Take a break or hang in there for the next forty minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our final witness today is Evan Meenan um, from the Department of State's Attorneys, and after Emmett. After Evan speaks, we'll probably take a break and then talk a little bit about the bill and, uh, and then go to our confirmation at 11. Uh, good morning. For the record, my name is Evan Meenan, and I'm a deputy state's attorney in the executive director's office of the Department of State's Attorneys. Um, I'm going to try and keep my testimony brief because many of the other witnesses covered much of the important information related to this topic. Uh, but I can say that the department supports the intent behind S-184, which is the bill that, that is presently before you, and also the intent of Act 27, as articulated in the letter from Senator Sears and Representative Grad. Um, but it does think that you know, S-184 does a nice job of trying to clean up some of the language um, from Act 27. And uh, the department agrees with Judge Zone that it would be good to clarify the intent in statute so that we, we don't have to try and rely on that letter. Um, Senator Benning was correct that I had offered up some, some language that's slightly different from that that appears in S-184. Um, and I can ex I'm happy to explain that language, but ultimately I think S-184 um, does also accomplish, albeit in a different way, what the department's language was trying to accomplish. And, and so we support the bill. Um, the language that the department offered up tried to do two things. The first thing it did was in subsection one that we've been talking about where it has that list of all of the people that you're, you're permitted to use deadly force to, to defend. We just suggested getting rid of that list and just having the language read in the just and necessary defense of the person's own life or the life of another person. 
And I would anticipate that courts would look to existing case precedent to determine what just and necessary is. Um, we think that that language is more consistent with the language in some of the model jury instructions that have already been referenced and some of the case law that's already been referenced and gets rid of some of that antiquated language um, that's in the list of enumerated relationships. The second thing that we tried to do was, which S S184 does, is uh, make it clear that you know, for example, if I if it's late at night and I'm leaving work and I round the corner and I see another individual sexually assaulting or attempting to 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 murder a, a stranger who I don't know, I don't need to wait until the alleged perpetrator puts me in fear of imminent bodily harm in order to respond with deadly force. That I can just go ahead and defend the alleged victim, but we. What we tried to do in the manner in which we did it was clarify that when it comes to burglaries and robberies, it's not, it, it shouldn't be, you can just use deadly force to repel any burglary or robbery. It should be those burglaries and robberies that are committed in a, in a violent way. Um, you know, obviously that's, it's a policy decision for the legislature, but we were trying to address in a cleaner way the same concerns um, that Act 27 was attempting to address. So the language that we put forward was, was, I think, pretty simple. It just said suppression of a person attempting to commit burglary or robbery with force or violence or murder, sexual assault or aggravated sexual assault. But, but again, the department is fine with the proposed language in subsection two of S-184. Um, I'd like to just spend a minute talking about why we might need both subsections one and subsections two. I, I've always viewed them as operating somewhat like a Venn diagram where there are you know, two circles overlapping somewhat and there is some conduct that is arguably covered by both. For example, you know, subsection one talks about defending uh, you know, your life or, the, or someone else's life, while subsection two talks about preventing a murder. So there's, there's some subject matters that are addressed in both, arguably in both subsections. However, I'm also, I think like some of the other senators have mentioned, a little hesitant of opening up potential can of worms by, by amending these statutes too much and really trying to get them to align with the the, the case law that was discussed by Judge Zone, Senator Sears, and some others. Um, so the department is, is happy with S-184. We're very glad that you're taking it up and making the correction that you're making. Uh, we would support um, eliminating the list of enumerated relationships in subsection one. Um, but if the legislature decides not to do that, I, I don't see that we would be making any huge concessions in terms of how the Supreme Court and, and our other courts apply the doctrine of self-defense. Thank you. Other questions for Evan? Senator Benning. Evan, uh, Julio brought up the, the question of the list in subsection two. And I'm still wrestling with that. If, if I'm seeing somebody literally being forced into the trunk of a car, um, that doesn't fit into this particular list. Yeah, it, your, it, yeah, you're, I'm just looking for your reaction. Yeah, so I mean, I guess in that situation, there's two things that I guess we would have to think about, right? The first is, if, if I see someone being forced into the trunk of a car, I might instantly go, to kidnapping, right? And then, you know, assuming that I, I was a, a citizen who was aware of this statute, I might be thinking, oh boy, this is a kidnapping. I can't use deadly force, you know? But um, there's two things we have to think about, as I mentioned. The first is, you know, what circumstances surrounding that incident are, and would they lead me to conclude that that person's life is in peril? If so, then I may still be able to use deadly force. But let's just assume that that's not true. I, I don't have any reason to believe that anything other, other than a kidnapping is occurring. 
and the person's not going to die or be sexually assaulted as a result of it. That does not necessarily mean that I can't intervene and use force to prevent that kidnapping from happening. This statute is only talking about a justifiable homicide. So it might mean that initially I can't just walk in and, and shoot that person. But as you know, I think it was Judge Zone mentioned, I might be entitled to use any force in the defense of that person that that person might be able to use to defend themselves. And as a couple of witnesses have mentioned, there, there are model jury instructions that we have in Vermont that are derived from case law that explain when someone can use non-deadly force in the defense of someone else. And sometimes those jury instructions are a really good cheat sheet for yeah. learning what the law is. And so what might end up happening in your situation is maybe I can't um, use deadly force right away. Maybe I try and insert myself in between the victim and the perpetrator to prevent the crime from happening. And then let's say that the alleged perpetrator escalates their use of force and they whip out their gun and say, I'm taking this person one way or another, right? At that point, then I might be able to meet that force that, that deadly force with deadly force. It's sort of like a, a ratcheting up in that way. You, you, you know, if, some, if I see someone punching someone, I can't just whip out my gun and shoot them, but I might be able to use some form of reasonable force to resist that. And then if they ratchet it up, I, I might also be able to ratchet up. That, that's a very oversimplification of, of the existing yeah. law related to defense, but that's, that's generally how it tends to work. I, I think there have been many cases where carjackings have been attempted and nobody realizes there's a baby in the back seat, for example. And the person that's car, whose car is being carjacked may not be in any imminent peril and nobody would know that, but that doesn't prevent you from taking steps to prevent that carjack. That kind of, I think it's a clearer example. Because you didn't, nobody knew there was a baby in the back. See. Right. And, and again, I mean, th these are all situations that, ha you know, the law has to apply to the unique yeah. facts at present. But yes, you're right. There's all different types of situations like that where, um, you know, it's a fact case specific. What level of force is reasonably necessary? It's not always going to be deadly force. Matt Galerio has a comment or question, Matt. Unless your hand is just up by mistake. but being able to get it down is a whole other story. Um, <laughs> there I, I think go. Peggy just did it for you. No, I did it, but, uh, you know, had to find, we use so many different platforms online nowadays between yeah. WebEx, Zoom, and whatever. I don't know where the right button is sometimes. And Anyway, I, I maybe this is just the way my mind works, but I, I appreciate what uh, the state's attorneys are offering here. Um, I'm a big proponent of keeping it simple. Um, and it is the, uh, you know, Senator Benning's bill as it is, uh, does exactly that um, and does not do, uh, you know, any harm or trauma to uh, longstanding case law. I, I, the scenario that uh, um, State's Attorney Mead has talked about, to me, in retrospect, you know, if you're a jury looking at something after the fact, it's very easy to, it's not easy to try to deconstruct what was going on in the minds of people at the time an incident was going on. But where you, you know, you're trying to, you're a, a, respond to split second sort of decisions where you believe that there's deadly force uh, might be necessary. Um, I think that I would not want to tinker with that. Um, and, you know, one of the things about relying on model jury instructions is they are an amalgamation of case law that has come down over the years. When, but when you are developing case law, particularly for homicide trials, um, oftentimes that uh, 
or I mean, I'm, I meant to say jury instructions for homicide trials. It is very fact specific to that particular type of whatever that situation was. And so to pull them out of a model situation can get a little bit dangerous because you know, it's like the, you know, the chocolate shake is tasty and the vanilla shake is tasty and the strawberry take it, to, you know, strawberry shake is tasty. But if you mix them all together, it's not so tasty. Um, and I think that that's what ends up happening when with some of these model jury instructions, people have committees have looked at them and kind of pulled the part that the committees like the best um, out of them. And I, I know Judge Zone was... Uh, one at one point was one of the uh, he either chaired the committee that produced one of the sets of model jury instructions, um, but it's very much a committee process as opposed to a on the ground case process. Um, so to me, if you set forth the appropriate simple policy concept, then allow the courts to fashion the jury instructions consistent with precedent and with um, the statute, you are going to have something that is more predictable uh, going forward. And that's what all lawyers, I think, want. Um, what uh, um, Evan is talking about a little bit, I think, is almost a, a, a bit of a bringing a civil standard into this uh, you know, uh, how how a uh, negligent homicide or a wrongful death might, you might look at it in, in different gradations, but it's different to me in a criminal situation. It, it, and I'm just hearing that having listened to his testimony, I'd have to uh, look a little bit closer, closer at it. But uh, uh, that's what I'm hearing. Uh, I think the betting approach in this, uh, to me, uh, keeps it simple and easier to apply uh, what the general concept of what the legislature wants to get across as opposed to um, a more specific direction um, that might might be confusing uh, when when you're looking at it in terms of prior case law common law and the like so I, I bottom line is I prefer a simpler approach and, and I and I like the bill in that regard thank you we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break till 20 minutes of 11. And uh, then we'll come back and uh, Evan uh, will pick up with you. I see you have a comment, a question, and, try, and as does Senator White. And then we'll try to uh, let Eric know what we would like for a second uh, go around with this bill next week when we can fit it in. <laughs> 